Have you ever just stopped and wondered how your favorite app seems to know exactly what you want almost before you do? How can a machine learn to spot credit card fraud or recommend the perfect movie or even help doctors diagnose diseases? Well, it really all boils down to two very powerful but very different ways that machines learn. One is kind of like having a teacher and the other is like exploring on your own. Let's break it down. Okay, let's start with a really simple analogy. Think about the difference between Netflix and Spotify. Netflix is learning from super clear signals you're giving it all the time. You rate a movie thumbs up. You binge watch an entire series. It's being trained on your very clearly labeled behavior. But Spotify? Spotify is playing a whole different game. It's a master of discovery, finding these hidden connections between songs based on their sound, their tempo, their mood, grouping them in ways you'd never think of without you having to label a single thing. So that first approach, the Netflix way, brings us to our first major concept. The best way to think about it is like studying for a big test, but you've been given a complete set of flashcards where every single answer is already printed right there on the back. Yeah, this is what we call supervised learning. And it's exactly what it sounds like. There is a supervisor involved. The machine is essentially handed a massive detailed answer key. It gets trained on data that's been meticulously labeled, usually by humans, with all the correct outcomes. So it just learns to map a specific input to a specific output over and over again. A perfect example of this in the real world? Credit card fraud detection. An algorithm gets fed millions and millions of past transactions, and every single one is clearly marked, this was fraud, this was the jicked. It crunches all that data and learns the super subtle patterns of what fraudulent activity looks like. That way, when a grand new transaction comes in, it can go, hey, wait a minute, this one looks fishy. And the thing to remember here is that this whole process is really, really structured. It follows a clear path. You have to start by gathering all that labeled data, which is a huge job. Then you figure out how to present that data to the machine, pick the right algorithm for the job, and then you train it and test it to see how accurate you got. It's very methodical, very goal-oriented. And this is where you really see its power, right? Supervised learning is the engine behind so many things we just take for granted. It's fantastic for problems where you have a really specific target. Is this email spam or not? Can you predict the price of this house? Is this customer about to leave us? It uses this whole toolbox of powerful algorithms from the classics like linear regression all the way up to incredibly complex neural networks. Okay, that's all well and good, but what if you don't have an answer key? What if you're not even totally sure what question you're trying to ask in the first place? Well, welcome to the world of unsupervised learning. In this scenario, we give the algorithm a huge pile of raw, unlabeled data, and we basically just tell it, go find interesting stuff. Its whole job is to explore the data and see if it can find any hidden patterns, any structures, any relationships, all on its own. And this is a really fundamental shift in how we think about it, right? This isn't about prediction anymore. It's all about discovery. You use unsupervised learning when you have a hunch that there are valuable insights hiding in your data, but you just don't know what they look like yet. You let the data tell its own story. So this is the perfect tool for things like customer segmentation, grouping your customers into distinct clusters for marketing that you never even knew existed, or for anomaly detection, you know, spotting a bizarre spike in your server data that might signal a cyber attack. It's all about finding the unknown unknowns, the things you didn't even know you should be asking about. All right, so we've got the theory down, but to really nail this down and make it stick, let's put these two approaches head to head and just see how they stack up on all the key points. So this table just lays it all out nice and simple. On one side, you've got supervised learning. It needs those labeled data points. Its goal is prediction, and it's really easy to measure how well it did. You can get a clear accuracy score. On the other hand, unsupervised learning starts with unlabeled data, its goal is discovery, and measuring success, well, it's a bit trickier. It often takes a human to look at the results and say, oh wow, that's actually a super useful insight. But enough theory, right? What does this actually look like when the rubber meets the road? Let's jump into a really cool medical case study where unsupervised learning was used to tackle a huge, complicated data set and find some hidden clues. So picture this, researchers are staring at this massive breast cancer data set. They have tons and tons of different measurements for every single sample, dozens of them. But here's the kicker, no labels, no predefined groups. They just wanted to see if the data itself would reveal natural groupings that might line up with different types of tumors. But right away, they hit this massive wall, something in data science called the curse of dimensionality. It's a kind of a weird counterintuitive idea, but basically the more features or dimensions you have, the more noise you have. 
It's like trying to listen to a single conversation in a giant, chaotic, noisy stadium. All the extra background noise just drowns out the signal you're trying to find. So check this out. When they first just threw a standard clustering algorithm at the raw high dimensional data, this is what they got. I mean, you can kind of see two groups trying to form, but it's a mess, right? They're all overlapping. The algorithm is just struggling to find a clean separation because of all that noise. So what do you do? Well, you bring in one of the superstars of unsupervised learning, dimensionality reduction. They used a famous technique called Principal Component Analysis, or PCA, which is specifically designed to take a huge, messy data set and boil it down to just its most important ingredients, essentially filtering out all that noise. And in this chart, this is where the magic happens. Look at how steep that curve is right at the beginning. That's telling us that just a handful, in this case only three, of these new combined principal components could explain almost all of the important variation in the original data set. They were able to shrink dozens of features down to just three without losing the good stuff. And here's the punchline. After they reduced the data's complexity, the results were just dramatic. The quality of the clusters, which we can measure with something called a silhouette score, it just skyrockets. The groups became way more distinct. And as a really nice bonus, it was even faster to process. It was a total win-win. Better results and faster too. So, after seeing how powerful both of these approaches are on their own, the big logical question is, where do we go from here? Do we have to pick one or the other? Or can we maybe get the best of both worlds? And the answer is, we don't have to choose. The future is totally hybrid. There's the super exciting field called semi-supervised learning, which is exactly what it sounds like. You use a small amount of that expensive, hard to get labeled data to give some hints and guidance to an unsupervised algorithm as it chews through a mountain of unlabeled data. You really do get the best of both. And it doesn't even stop there. We're seeing some mind-blowing advances. Things like self-supervised learning, where a model is clever enough to create its own labels right from the raw data. Or few-shot learning, which is trying to get models to learn from just one or two examples, kind of like how we humans do. And through it all, there's this huge push to make these black boxes more transparent and understandable. And that kind of leaves us with this one big final thought to chew on. As we generate more and more complex data every single day, maybe the biggest breakthroughs of the future won't come from getting better answers to the questions we already know how to ask, but from letting these powerful unsupervised algorithms loose to find the incredible game-changing patterns we never even knew to look for in the first place.